Okay, so this is one of my favorite, I have to admit, this is one of my favorite topics because as I've already told you, I'm a big archaeology fan. I love archaeology. I love studying old stuff. And I love especially seeing how man has really not evolved in the way that you think. Okay, from back 4,000 years ago, we have man having a complex society. These guys were civilized. They had laws. They had taxes. They had adultery. They had all sorts of soap opera stuff going on. In other words, man has not changed much in 4,000 years. We know a lot more stuff. We have computers that can hold stuff for us. But as far as man, how we act, how we do things, we haven't changed much. And archaeology studies that. Archaeology tries to understand what man was like. If anything, I think we've lost some technology. Have you seen some of the ruins down in South, Am uh, South America? Even the ruins of Egypt. We don't know how they did those pyramids. Because basically using modern stuff, it would take us a whole lot longer time to do a pyramid than it took them. So, did they have technology that we don't? I mean, there are stones put together where you can't fit a coin in the crack. It is so perfectly quarried, so perfectly put together down in South America. All right, so one of the really cool things about archaeology is trying to figure out how old the stuff is. And the concept that we use in order to figure that out is called Half-Life. And you thought Half-Life was just a video game. Just like with other chemical reactions we've talked about, we need to know more about a nuclear reaction than just what's reacting and what's being produced. Probably the most important thing to learn is how much of the product is being made and how fast. Now, you've heard of Half-Life. It's the measurement that tells us just that. The time it takes for exactly one half of the sample to decay. Different nuclei have different half-lives. By knowing the half-life, we can calculate how much of a sample will be gone in a given amount of time. For example, the half-life of phosphorus-32 is 14.3 days. So if you start with a 100-gram sample, after about two weeks, you'll have 50 grams left. After another two weeks, half of the remainder would decay, leaving only 25 grams of undecayed phosphorus, and so on. Now, you might be asking, if radioactive elements are always decaying into more and more stable isotopes that are eventually no longer radioactive, why are they still around at all? Fascinating question. You seem to have brought your clever pants today. Well, well, it's fairly simple. Given enough time, all radioactive elements would decay into non-radioactive forms. Even ultra-stable bismuth with its half-life longer than the age of the universe. But elements with short half-lives are around because they were decayed into by elements that recently decayed into them. The chain of decay from the element originally produced in whatever supernova created them to the elements that exist on Earth now left billions and billions of years. Also, I should note that some radioactive isotopes like carbon-14 in the atmosphere are constantly being renewed by cosmic rays. Now, okay, so question. If we think about Serenity and the fact that she goes through a decay series until finally she becomes, was it Monica? Oh, Tom. 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 Tom, that is no longer radioactive. When we consider Serenity, do you realize that if we have a hundred Serenities, it would take thousands and thousands and thousands of years for all those serenities to finally become Tom. Why? Because of the concept of half-life. Why is it important for us to know how long it takes for a radioactive isotope to decay? For us, number one, if we're messing around with radioactive stuff as medicine, it would be good to know how long it's going to be radioactive inside your body. Number two, if we're having to store nuclear waste, it would really be nice to know how long it'll take before it's no longer radioactive. Number three, and this is my favorite use, it helps us be able to determine how old the Iceman was, or how old the Shroud of Turin is. I think back at Tom Benning. 
Tom Benning, as a sophomore, came very close to breaking, to winning the state championship in cross country as a sophomore. Tom Benning has given me permission to talk about him, even though he's probably in his 30s now. Okay? So Tom Benning was an outstanding cross country er racer person. Okay? Then something happened. Over the summer, even though he was running, he gained a lot of weight. And the weight gain caused him to have shin splints, which pretty much demolished him for his junior year. What happened was that the reason why he gained weight was because his thyroid gland had stopped working properly. They tried giving him medicine in order to help his thyroid gland, in order to uh, help him to get back to the shape he was, it never really worked. They finally decided that his thyroid gland, if left untreated, was going to kill him. So they gave him radioactive 131 iodine. There's only one part of your body that likes iodine, and that is your thyroid, thyroid gland. So they gave him massive doses of radioactive iodine in hopes that his thyroid gland would absorb it and then the alpha decay in the iodine-131, I think it's alpha decay, was going to obliterate his thyroid gland, kill it, destroy it. Mm. So they sent him home and they told him it'd be best if he stayed home, in bed, and away from children and pregnant women for three days. Why? He was going to be very radioactive for three days. Why little children and pregnant women? They get more susceptible to Why are children and pregnant women more susceptible to radiation? Their immune systems are lower. What type of cells? Not specific. What is the attribute of cells that are the most sensitive to radiation? No, no. What type of cells? White, white. cells. Okay, white blood, white blood cells, red blood cells, white skin cells. Um. They're all fast-growing cells. Fast-growing cells are the ones that are the most susceptible to radiation. So why did they tell them to stay away from pregnant women? Uh, yeah, th th their babies are rapidly developing inside of them. Why little children? They're rapidly developing. So Tom ben Benning was very radioactive for three days. Why three days? Because they knew the half-life of the iodine they had given him. So what is half-life? Did he get better? Uh, he is living and successful now, but he never got better enough to regain his cross-country startup. Half-life is the time it takes for one half of the atoms in a sample to decay. In other words, the time it takes, if we have 100 serenities, for 50 of those serenities to become Tom. Here are some examples, carbon-14, it takes 5,730 years for half of carbon-14 to decay down into normal, average, everyday nitrogen-14. For polonium-212 to decay down to whatever descendant is no longer radioactive is 0 0.000003. So if you're pouring it onto a beaker, by the time it takes for it to pour into a beaker, then most of it has already become top. And then you have uranium-238, which is about, the half-life is about as old as the Earth. Now, the secret to understanding half-life can be found in a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper. This happens to have to me, this is the color orange. I've been told this is um, salmon. Salmon, but to me it's orange. An orange piece of paper will explain half-life. 
The misconception, the number one misconception that people have about Half-Life is that if the Half-Life, let's say, is, is, uh, is 10 years and you have a 100-gram sample, then after 10 years, how much of it will no longer be radioactive? How much of it, I'm sorry, how much of it will 50, still be radioactive? 50. 50 grams. Okay, so 10 years have gone by, 50 grams, still around, still serenity, or one of her descendants that's still radioactive. Mm -hmm. After another 50 years, this is where people say, okay, well that's it, after 50, another 50 years, 100 years in total, done. Nope. No. No. They misunderstood what half-life is, because you have a hundred serenities and it's half-life her half-life is 50 years then after 50 years you will have 50 serenities still going and her descendants still radioactive after another 50 years for a total of 100 years you will now have half of half one quarter one quarter okay so after 150 years, you will have one-eighth still left. After 200 years, you will have one-sixteenth. After 250 years, you will have one-thirty-second. After 300 years, you will have... And I don't think I can fold it anymore. <laughs> okay? So how many years will it take for a hundred serenities to become nothing? Many, many years. Okay, because every half-life halves what you have left over. Exactly. Is it possible to predict when a given atom will decay? Do we know when serenity can we be expecting could we have serenity day when we all come in and look at her because we know that on that day she is going to decay no all we can say is that in a 50 year period of time if we have a hundred serenities 50 of them will have decayed down into time that's all we can say we don't know exactly when it will happen we just know that within 50 years, half of it will have decayed down into non-radioactive stuff. Is she going to decay now? We don't know. Now! We don't know. Oh, it happened. You guys missed it. Now! We don't know. It can happen at any time. That's right. Why is carbon-14 such an important isotope to us? Because it helps us date materials that came from living matter. It helps us date materials that come from living matter. <coughs> How does it do this? Number one, we have carbon-14 inside of us. We eat carbon-14. Most of what we eat is carbon-based materials. So we are eating billions upon billions of carbon atoms every day. Some of those are carbon-14. Some of them are radioactive. We put them inside our bodies. They become part of us. We're all radioactive. So the next time you go to your family reunion, you go, oh, you're from Oak Ridge. You're radioactive. So you go, ha, ha, ha. yeah, so are you, you idiot. <laughs> you obviously have not studied chemistry. Everyone is radioactive. If you're alive, you're radioactive. If you're recently dead, you're radioactive. If you died 10,000 years ago, there's not much of you that's radioactive probably we get rid of stuff every day when you do number one and number two some of the radioactive carbon 14 leaves your body but that's okay because we replace it every day by eating you eat and you replace it every day 
So the amount of carbon-14 you have in your body pretty much stays the same. It remains the same throughout your body. You lose some, you gain some. You lose some, you gain some. So the amount of carbon-12 to carbon-14, that ratio will remain the same for the rest of your life. Until you die. When you die, you stop doing number two and you stop doing number one on a regular basis. You also stop eating on a regular basis as well. So however much carbon-14 you died with, that's how much carbon-14 you now have to deal with. And over time, that carbon-14 becomes nitrogen-14. So over time, you become less and less radioactive. Radioactive, radioactive. Oh, I'm less radioactive if I'm dead. The less radioactive your body is, the longer it has been sitting around decaying. How do we know how old something is? For people, we'd ask to see their birth certificate. For trees, we'd count the rings. But how do we know how old a fossil is? Fossils have their own internal clock. Scientists can read it by looking at the ratio of two different types of carbon atoms. Of course, every living thing is made of carbon. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to form complex organic molecules. Animals get their carbon by eating these plants. But there's more than one form of carbon. Most carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons. We call this carbon-12. High up in the atmosphere, sometimes cosmic rays hit nitrogen atoms. This creates carbon with six protons and eight neutrons. We call this carbon-14. Carbon-12 and carbon-14 behave alike. But carbon-14 has one unique and important attribute. It's unstable. So once an animal dies, the carbon-14 in its body will start to go away. Every 5,730 years on average, about half of the carbon-14 atoms will decay into nitrogen. This is its half-life. After one half-life, the animal will have about half the amount of carbon-14 it started with. After another half-life, it will have about a quarter. And after another half-life, it will have about an eighth. By contrast, the amount of carbon-12 it has in its body will stay the same. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can measure how many thousands of years have passed since the animal died. Carbon dating works for fossils up to about 60,000 years old. For older fossils, scientists use unstable elements that have much longer half-lives. For Scientific American's Instant Egghead, I'm Michael Moyer. What has been the practical application in recent years? In 1991, a hiker during the summer, found a body in a crevasse. They thought somebody had been killed and dumped in the crevasse, or somebody had fallen and died in the crevasse. Okay? So they got alpine people that know how to scale these icy formations, and they went down there thinking that it was a modern person, and they found a fur-covered bearded man whose body the body had pretty much been squished but it was still pretty fresh okay he you could even see the tattoos on him you could see birthmarks it was a fresh very old body so they dug him out and they found that the ice man contained about half of the carbon-14 present in living creatures today. Okay, which meant that a whole half-life had gone through and it had cut it in half. So how old was the Iceman? According to the evidence, the Iceman was about 5,300 years old. No way. We're talking, those of you who are familiar with the Bible, you're talking about the time of Abraham, the time of Job. 
over 2,000 years before the time of Jesus. So, apparently this guy was walking around, minding his own business during the Ice Age. He got bonked in the head because they found that he died from a hematoma. He uh, had been bonked in the head and actually cracked open his skull. And either he was dumped into the crevasse or he fell in there. And that winter, almost immediately, within days, he was covered in snow and ice. And then the glacier, the glacier froze around him, crushing his body. And only recently has it melted down enough so that they could find the body again. The other, uh, the other thing that we're going to study is, uh, for you Catholics, is, is it one of your relics. It's called the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin. Does anyone know about the Shroud of Turin? It is the supposed burial cloth of Jesus. Okay? And there is an image of a crucified man on this almost a 12 foot long piece of cloth. It's one cloth and apparently what they would have done is they would have put the body on one half of the cloth and then draped the other half over the body. So there is a faint image of a human being. It's almost like a negative, and we'll talk more about this, a negative image of a human being. And uh, there's blood stains on the cloth that are consistent with somebody that having been crucified. So for many, many years, for hundreds of years, the Catholic Church has claimed that this Shroud of Torino was the burial cloth of Christ. Okay, so they conducted carbon-14 dating on it, and it turned out to have been made, or at least the cloth was alive when it was cotton, was alive back in the 1200s. Okay? Now, there are some limitations to carbon-14, and we'll talk about this, because some of the scientists who originally conducted the test back in the late 1970s have now repudiated their own findings and say that the cloth may be much older. But basically, if you're alive, if you were alive at some point, we can date you within 50 years, if the circumstances are right. Can half-lives or the rate of decay for radioisotopes be changed by us? Can we speed up half-life or slow it down? The answer is no, we cannot. We cannot. We can't alter it. It seems to be its own little time clock, and we can't change it in any way. So what does this mean when we consider radioactive waste storage or its disposal? If we're having to store radioactive waste in Y12, how long should we store it for? Could take a very, very long time. That's the problem with nuclear energy. The waste that is produced is going to be with us for a very long time. We can't speed up its decay. Yes, sir? Uh, what are the numbers of the carbon-12, carbon-14? What is the what? The number, like carbon-12, carbon-14, what are the numbers in Oh, well, we, I thought we've gone over this. It, those are the different isotopes. So carbon-12, Carbon-12, oops, carbon-12 carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-14 has six protons. It always has to have six protons in order for it to be carbon, and six and eight neutrons. Okay, so <clears throat> my target for today was simply to get you to the point where you understood half-life and could do some simple, some simple um, math problems. 
So really, with these things, typically you don't need a calculator. You may need to, a calculator every once in a while. <clears throat> There's two ways, of, two kinds of problems you're going to see. Problem where they're going to give you the time and they want to know how much stuff is left over. Then they give you how much stuff is left over and they want time elapsed. And that's what they did with the Iceman. For these, you do divide and then the thingy. With these, you do the thingy and then multiply. So divide thingy or thingy multiply. And I'll show you what I mean by the thingy. I don't know what else to call you. Call this. Call it the half-life thingy. Something, it's, it's a way that I do it. Makes it real easy. <laughs> okay, you got it? All right. So, an isotope of cesium has a half-life of 30 years. If 10 milligrams of cesium-137 disintegrates over a period of 90 years, so they gave you time, how many milligrams of cesium-137 would remain? Ah, so which one is this? Time to how much? Okay, so the first thing you do is divide. What do you think you divide? You divide the half -life. how much time has gone by by the half-life. So how many half-lives have gone by? Three half-lives. That's the divide part. Now comes the thingy. Uh -oh. This is what I do. You ready? Ten divided in half gives me five. That's one half-life. How many times are we going to have to do this? Three total. Five divided by two gives you? 2.5. That's two half-lives have gone by. Two half-lives, 60 years have gone by. And then finally, two and a half divided by three is 1.25. And that's the third half-life. And that is your answer. No, no. This is the half. Sorry. Divided by two. Every time you're dividing by two. Half. Half. So half of ten is one half life. Half of five. Half of two and a half. Are there any units or anything? Well, this is milligrams. I'm sorry. Milligrams. How many milligrams? Point 1.25. Okay? Do another one. A 25 gram sample of an isotope of strontium 90 was formed in a 1960 explosion of an atomic bomb at Johnson Island in the Pacific test site. The half life of strontium 90 is 28 years. In what year will 6.25 grams of the original 25 grams will remain? So, what do they want to know? Do they want to know the time elapsed or do they want to know how much stuff is left over? Time. Time. So time is thingy Divide. times. Oh. Thingy times. Okay, so we're going to, have to do the thingy first. Where do we begin with the thingy? Uh, what is the original amount? 25. So we need to get it to what amount? 6.25. 28 years is how much time? So 25 divided by 2? 
12.5. That's one half life. 12.5 divided by 2. Aha. Uh -huh. Two half lives. So how many half lives have gone by? Each half life is. Right? Yeah. Two half lives went by. The half lives are 28 years. Okay. 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 Serenity, you look puzzled. Mm -hmm. To go from 25 to 6.25, you had to divide it twice, twice oh, by I two. So that means two half lives. So that was 28 years, 28 years, for a total of. Oh, okay. 56. Okay, but really, this is not the answer. Because what did they want to know? How much will remain? In what year? Oh, please. So what year did it start? 1960. How many years have gone by? So next year you'll be down to 6.25 milligrams, or grams. One more? Yes. These are all in your notes, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The half-life of isotope X is 2.0 years. How many years, ah, uh, so is this divide thingy or thingy multiply? Multiply. Thingy multiply. How many years would it take for four milligrams to only have half a milligram. All right, let's do the thingy. Beginning with what, Bailey? What is your beginning amount? And we need to go to? Okay. So let's let a half-life go by and you have Did we reach our goal, Bailey? Let's divide it in again. Two divided by two, Bailey. Did we reach our goal? Let's divide it again. 1.0 divided by two. 0.5. Did we reach our goal? Okay, so it took one, two, three half lives. So we take the 3 and multiply it by 4.5. Okay, so we now know how to do some simple half-life calculations.